explain tonight's agenda. Thank you, Serena. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I am so excited to have uh, everyone joining us tonight for this online conversation about the people in your neighborhood, creative or creative strategies for meaningful engagement. And, and we're just looking forward to a great discussion that we hope everyone who is attending will be part of in some form or another. Like Rebecca said, my name is Serena Unrein, and I'm with the Arizona Partnership for Healthy Communities. And we are a statewide collaboration that focuses on the underlying conditions that allow for health and well being. And I'm really excited that we'll be joined by a couple of experts tonight to share their insight and opinions on community engagement. And I wanted to thank City of Two resources for hosting this discussion because I think it's incredibly important, especially as all of our in-person engagement has really shifted over the last year, but engaging our neighbors and figuring out how to do so effectively and equitably is more important now than it ever has been before. I think we're all a little bit more aware right now than we were a year ago about how important it is to be connected and, and feel like we are part of a community. So a few things to note before I introduce or have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, since this is a regular Zoom meeting, I'm going to ask everyone to just keep yourself on mute. But if you would like to to type any thoughts that you're having into the chat. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat or go to the uh, bottom of your screen and under the reactions button, there's also the option to raise your hand. Um, and if I, if I seem to miss both of your raised hand or any sort of comment you might type into the chat, you also have the option to unmute yourself and just ask a question because we really do want this to be a conversation that you're part of. And even though we have a couple of people here who, who have a lot of insight, we're not really looking to just have this be a lecture. We want this to be a discussion where you can ask questions and they'll be having a conversation uh, about what they've seen in community engagement as well. But since we do have a fair number of people here tonight, we have 32 people in the room right now, I'll ask you to go ahead and stay on mute for the majority of this uh, workshop tonight. City of Tucson is also recording this. Someone had asked if the slides were available to download so we could take notes. We're, there won't be a lot of slides. We might have some pictures that our, our panelists will show, but uh, and I, perhaps those are available, but there aren't really any slides per se. So you can, you can certainly take notes as you follow along though. Um, and, and finally, uh, everyone who got, I, I believe everyone who re re registered for this forum for this workshop will get a link to the room. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists and my pro tip for you is if you like to keep them up on your screen, you have a couple of options for the view so you can always keep the people who are speaking. In the upper right hand corner, if you're on a computer or a laptop, there is a box or there's a box with nine little squares in it and you can change the view to the speaker mode. And that should put a speaker up on screen. The other option is if you are looking at somebody's video in particular, you can pin their video and that way you will be able to see um, see the person who is speaking. So those are a couple of options. If you need additional help, you can type that into the chat and someone who is paying attention can go ahead and uh, answer any questions you might have on, on the technical side of things. You can keep your camera on or turn it off. If you're asking a question, um, it might be helpful to turn your camera on, but that's, that's entirely up to you. And my final, oh, I had one more thought and I've already forgotten it. So if I think of it again, I will come back to it, but I'm going to go ahead and have our two panelists introduce themselves. I will start with Evren with Living Streets Alliance, uh, who is based in Tucson. So Evren, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your history with community engagement? Sure. Thank you so much, Serena. Thank you, Rebecca, and everyone else who's joining us this evening. Hello. Um, my name is Evren. I'm with Living Streets Alliance. Um, I imagine some of you are familiar with Living Streets Alliance. Maybe some of you haven't heard of us. 
We're a local um, nonprofit advocacy organization here based in Tucson, very small. Um, and we advocate for a thriving Tucson by creating great streets for all of us. So we also put on the event um, Cicluvia, maybe some of you are familiar with that. Obviously things have changed a little bit since COVID in the past year or so, but um, just another connection to LSA if, if you're brain is trying to figure out where did I hear this name and I don't know these folks. Um, so I am the um, Director of Strategic Policy and Practice and um, most recently my work involved um, sort of leading the Complete Streets Policy work on the Living Streets Alliance side with a lot of collaboration with the City of Tucson and other partners and stakeholders and that policy was adopted a couple of years ago. It's now being implemented. So again, I'm just throwing these things out there because maybe some of you have intersected with our work through different channels, different programs, different advocacy efforts. So just um, a couple of things worth mentioning maybe. And then just um, to sort of give you, a, I guess, glimpse of how our work and my role within the organization has shifted over the years. So I first came on board as um, someone to help co-create the Neighborhood Walkability Assessment Program. Um, and we did actually, um, I ended up leading maybe about a dozen walkability assessments with different neighborhoods. And again, I've noticed some names in the registration list. I can't see everyone right now on my screen, but maybe, um, maybe some of you are here. So hello, it's nice to see you again. Um, and so as we were doing these um, neighborhood walkability assessments, we started realizing that, you know, we're engaging with neighborhoods, we're hearing great things, people really wanna see all kinds of um, improvements in their neighborhoods. And um, there is the funding had dried out at that point, there was really not a lot of ways to fund it. So a lot of our focus shifted to advocacy to create funding for the types of improvements people wanted to see in their neighborhoods. And so we ended up um, you know, preparing a pedestrian safety and walkability package for the 2015 Pima County bond, which ended up not getting approved by voters, but then a lot of those projects that were identified during the walkability assessments ended up getting included in the um, Prop 407 Parks and Connections bond in, in, in the form of pedestrian safety and walkability projects. So full circle, now we're really in, involved in the community engagement aspect of Prop 407. And part of this is coming from this sort of long history of developing relationships and trust, cultivating relationships with a variety of neighborhoods in Tucson. And the other part of it is the sort of the lens that we bring in to make community engagement more um, meaningful, inclusive and equitable and, uh, and our efforts around that. So um, we've been partnering with the city of Tucson now. Um, they've been calling us sort of like the non-traditional community engagement partners. So our goal, our role is basically to supplement the work that the city does, you know, more the traditional open house style meetings, supplementing these with things like, you know, actually meeting people where they are. So like having interviews with people on the street to hear from them about what types of things they wanna see included in the project or um, hosting an ice cream, social and a bike um, and, a, and a biking movie night at a neighborhood park so that um, the project is not the focus but people are coming to the space for a fun and family friendly event and at the same time there are city staff present who are talking to neighbors about the project that's coming to their neighborhood so um, I'll maybe just stop there but just one other thing real quick I also am pretty involved in my own neighborhood association I live in Rincon Heights so I think as the as the conversation continues this evening, I'll probably be sort of like switching hats and and um, trying to bring in perspectives from both my sort of professional role, but then also as a neighborhood person. So thanks again. Nice to see you all. Thanks, Evren. That is a great background on all of your all of the different community engagement hats that you wear. So hopefully people are already thinking of questions that you want to ask Evren. So you you don't have to wait at any point to ask either of our panelists questions. You can ask them at any point during the workshop. We'll we'll the most important thing to me is that we get to the questions that everyone came here to get answered, not my pre 
pre-written list of questions. So I will also have us introduce and meet our other panelists. So Lisa, would you like to share a little bit about yourself and your background? And uh, I know that's a little bit different than Everin's. So you'll see why we invited these two to share their expertise. Well, good, good evening, everybody. It's exciting to see everyone and, uh, and share you know, uh, a conversation about community engagement. So uh, I graduated in 2007 uh, with a degree in real estate development and urban design with the intention of be working for a boutique um, a boutique developer that does infill development, but unfortunately it was 2007, so nobody was really hiring except for uh, the city of Phoenix. And so I took the opportunity that was in front of me and I started working at the city as actually a landscape architect intern and then um, ended up getting a full-time position as a site planner. So doing you know, construction uh, document review and those types of things. Um, but because it was 2007 and the start of the Great Recession, um, things quickly started shifting at the city and we saw um, budget cuts, cuts coming down the lines and big shifts of staff. And so I ended up going from um, one department into another and started working for the planning department doing things like rezoning and special use permits and variances and also at the same time learning about long range planning so general plan and those types of things and so I started getting a taste of community engagement but very much in the very formal processes that are often associated with a rezoning process or a variance hearing or those types of things. And then I also got the opportunity to work on developing um, the downtown code, which is one of the first form-based codes um, in Arizona that was adopted. And through that process, I got to work with some committees and do a little bit of community engagement, but again, very formal and very, you know, um, more of like a feedback. Okay, we're gonna do this. All right, what do you think about it? Um, and so I did that for a couple of years and then another round of budget cuts came and I found myself in the Parks and Recreation Department as a landscape architect where I got the opportunity to do construction management, planning, um, landscape design, and really started kind of getting a taste for community engagement and getting outside of those formal processes. It's still, you know, um, when we would do a park master plan, there's still, you know, a bit of a process that we would adhere to um, it was still fairly structured, you know, always took place in a room. We always, you know, sometimes they were formal and we had to, you know, do open meeting law and all that good stuff. But I just started getting kind of a sense of what that was. And then I got this interesting opportunity thrown at me from um, the city manager's office. And again, this is the city of Phoenix. I know sometimes I say the city, um, that's year, you know, 10, 10 years of working at, at the city. Um, has kind of done that to me, but again, city of Phoenix, not city of Tucson. So I got this interesting opportunity thrown um, in my direction um, from the city manager's office. And basically the instructions were go out into the Grand Avenue community um, and work with the Grand Avenue uh, Merchants Association and basically support them in achieving their vision, um, which was like such a, you know, a twist on any community engagement I had ever done for the city before, because it was always like, okay, go take this information out and share it with the community and get some feedback. But a lot of times, you know, it was very limited feedback and very small little changes. But in this case, it was like, go out, work with the community, partner with them and figure out how you take a four lane, basically highway and turn it into a two lane walkable street with bike lanes and on street parking. And so I went out and, and kind of with that charge, just started having these conversations with the community and started figuring out like partnering with them. And we were able to secure a grant and then we were able to get a project off the ground, a planning project and um, all these barriers were coming up because you know, they were like, you'll never you know, turn this road into a two lane walkable street. You know, the street transportation director like right at the beginning was like, over my dead body will this project happen. Um, but because the community was so involved and they really were a partner, they were in on these meetings, these internal city meetings that normally community members aren't involved in. They were able to hear this, they were able to see this. And it's amazing the amount of 
barriers that just started dropping out of the way. That deputy director that was assigned to the project got moved off to another project. And um, we got someone else and he was like, well, we're just gonna have a conversation and see what we can do. Um, and so fast forward through this really um, amazing engagement process where we really brought a whole variety of stakeholders to the table. We set up our design studio actually on the street. So we got to, you know, as the designers get to experience and see the street and see it at different times and really kind of almost live there. Um, and the community members were there, you know, part of that process. And it was amazing the relationships that started being built out of this process and the, the ways in which groups that normally fight with each other, like, oh, I need this. No, 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 I need this. Start compromising and finding solutions among themselves. All of a sudden, you know, a 12 foot traffic lane that had to be this way, all of a sudden shrunk down to 10 feet because we knew we needed to get on street parking on both sides in order to accommodate um, what the businesses wanted. And so there were so many of these experiences with that. And so at the end of it, um, it essentially got approved by city council. And then within, I think like a year it was implemented and we called it the pigs fly plan, right? Cause like no one ever thought this was possible but yet it was. And so it really kind of transformed me, right? Cause I was like hooked, I was like, oh, oh wow, this is actually how we make change. Like when you actually partner with the community, you know, it's amazing what you can accomplish. And so I had that experience and then I had the opportunity to go work for the neighborhood services department and become a liaison between the city and the neighborhoods and really spend, I think it was about four or five years focused on community engagement and working with neighborhoods and working with nonprofits on figuring out how do we do community-based revitalization. And then in 2017, I decided it was time for me to kind of move on and have a new experience. You know, I never had intended to work for the city for, you know, five years, let alone 10 years. Um, so it just felt like it was a good time. And so I started my own consulting firm and have been working with nonprofits and uh, municipalities and actually uh, real estate developers on doing community engagement. Um, I'm a coach for the incubator project. I help with writing grants. I kind of do a jack of all trades. And so it's a good mix of everything. I'm really interested in why we have the places that we have and what are the pieces in it and figuring out how do we get more of our community involved in the process of building our community as well as um, benefiting from that development. Because there's so many great things that happen when we build a project and yet, you know, so much of that because of the way it's done, you know, it, it creates some interesting tensions. And so how do we start to, you know, partner with each other to create the great place, um, great places that we all want to live in. So that's, that's a little bit of my history and a little bit of the story of how uh, a project kind of changed my, my career and the trajectory that I was on. Thanks, Alyssa, for sharing that background. I am going to have us hop right into some questions uh, and I wanted to encourage everyone who's attending tonight to make sure that you're asking questions in the chat or raising your hand. We would also love to know who all of you are. So if you would like to type into the chat what neighborhood association you're with, uh, that would be really fun for us to know just since we, we might not know you just based on your name and the box on the Zoom screen. So that would be great if you could type that into the chat. So I'm going to have us get started and I'll have Evren start by answering this question. But what are some of the obstacles for people participating in neighborhood meetings? Like why, why would people not come to some of the neighborhood association events that have been held in the past? And, and what do you recommend? How has Living Streets Alliance overcome those or what have you seen be successful? Sure. I think some of the basic things, I mean, not just neighborhood meetings, but you know, we sort of come to the space a lot. Um, from the perspective of um, like public meetings in general for transportation projects and whatnot. But I think a lot of it applies to neighborhood meetings as well. Just I think the time and the resources people have is probably one of the um, primary challenges or barriers. Um, you know, people have kids, people have busy lives. Some people are working multiple jobs. Some people work in the evening when these meetings take place. Um, and 
a lot of times, you know, um, accommodating those schedules can be can be a, a barrier to people. So, um, again, put, you know, having to put food at the table and having to do, having to take care of children. Um, and then I've also seen like throughout, you know, through working with different neighborhoods, um, I feel like not every neighborhood association meeting is set up the same way. And that's fine. Of course, neighborhoods come up with their own unique ways of setting the table and, um, you know, it's, an, it's the art of gathering, right? So people do it in different ways. Um, but I've seen, I think, some situations where the, the, the space is very hierarchical. And I sometimes wonder how welcoming that is for people, you know, like there's this, there's the board neighborhood association officers and they sit someplace and the rest of the neighbors are sort of like audience at this meeting. So um, I tend to think that a more sort of like inclusive welcoming space um, might be more conducive to inviting more people in. Um, so that could be an, that could be a barrier. Um, and in terms of like how to, I guess, um, address some of these barriers or obstacles. Um, one way, um, let's just maybe start with the format, right? Like, I, cause I think the format is important. So um, how can we set the meeting space differently? How can we welcome people, people in? How, could we maybe have a social hour or like social half hour in the beginning where people are, are talking to each other and building relationships cause it's all about building relationships. Um, instead of you know, jumping straight to the agenda, which is fine to have an agenda, but can we create space for people to connect with each other first? This is something we've been doing in, even in our board meetings. And now that things are happening virtually, it's become even more important. Like, can we, can we maybe open up with some questions, right? Like one thing we did uh, at the, recently with COVID, you know, everyone shared a challenge that they're experiencing and then everyone shared something that keeps them going. And it's just like even that simple, a couple of prompts that get people to talk in the beginning before we start talking about whatever business is on the agenda, I think is critical to sort of like set the stage, create a welcoming environment. Um, and then in terms of, you know, issues like food and child care, um, what about we? What, what, what about the idea of maybe having child-friendly activities? Like, can we bring some crayons and then, ask kids to draw up something about their street, about the neighborhood, and then have them share it out at the beginning of the meeting. It's a great way, I think, to be more inclusive. And again, going back to that idea of, of building connections. Um, with food, you know, having potlucks, for example, people bring food so that it's, you know, because these meetings a lot of times coincide with people's either dinner cooking or dinner eating time. So. What if people who have the time and the energy to put into cooking actually brought some food and shared with people? And these sound like simple ideas, but I think they do make a difference. And we've seen some of that in our own neighborhood um, working out quite well. And one other thing we've tried is also like, you know, we have five meetings, for example, per year. And we decided having a couple of those meetings at a sort of like more informal setting so we've been gathering this is pre-covid so i think we'll get to covid at some point but just like we haven't been gathering indoors or even outdoors lately but we used to before covid um get together at a neighbor's backyard and so those meetings we keep the agenda light we don't have the some of the usual updates so things are a lot more social again focused on building relationships building connections inviting people in so i'll just i'll just stop there because I, I know Lisa has a lot of things to share and we can circle back. <laughs> Thanks for sharing those ideas. I, I particularly love that piece of getting to connect with people and have them ha say share, share something that's keeping you going. I think that's more important now than ever that we're connecting with our neighbors like that. Lisa, how about you? What, what do you think are uh, reasons that people might not participate and how do we overcome those obstacles? Well, I think, you know, one of the big breakthroughs for me with community engagement was really thinking about engagement as a relationship building process. And so, you know, to Evern's point of, you know, the spaces and these very formal meetings, you know, they're not really conducive for necessarily building relationships. I understand the purpose of them and why sometimes you need to have a more formal uh, type of 
arrangement. Um, you know, there's difficult decisions that need to be made. You know, you need to have kind of that process in place. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, um, translate very well into that relationship building piece. You know, you come, you sit, you listen to, you know, the speaker that comes, you know, oftentimes the police department gives their updates. Um, you're often in, a, you know, in a room. And so I think those are challenging. And then especially when you start to talk about, you know, engaging with communities of color, um, sometimes these spaces don't feel safe for them. And especially when you start, you know, adding in the police piece of it, and I understand the importance of that, but there is kind of that other side of it, is that something that oftentimes can cause tension or reasons why they don't feel comfortable coming into that space. So I think, you know, there's the physical space and how to set it up, adding meals, adding childcare. I think those are all really important. But I also think it's really important to think about other ways in which you can engage. I had a neighborhood um, in Phoenix that they were they were big dog people. Like the, everybody in that neighborhood seemed to own dogs or at least own quite a few of them. And the way in which they organized themselves was around their dogs and their morning dog walk. And it turned in from this informal thing of, okay, we just kind of meet up in the morning to, okay, every morning at, you know, 5.30 a.m., they were early risers too, we're going to go out and do a dog walk. And then another group let out, um, led a group in the evening that did a dog walk. And it was just amazing of like, just that little process of walking through the neighborhood as this group, you know, they started building relationships with each other. And then the neighbors would see these folks coming through and kind of know their walk and come out and have chats with them. And it just kind of lended itself then into creating a more formal organization. And then they had to think about some ways to engage folks that weren't dog owners, right? Because not everybody in the neighborhood was a dog owner. But, you know, those are example, that's an example of just kind of how do you use some of the informal things that you do as a neighborhood to kind of make those connections and start building those relationships. Um, another way that we've done stuff is like neighborhood cleanups, you know, I think for millennials, my, you know, my personal thing is like, I just sometimes sitting in a room, especially, you know, after working all day, going and sitting in a room and just kind of listening um, about, uh, you know, things kind of going on is, is, is tough, you know, after a long day. And sometimes, you know, I just want to go out and like create change in my neighborhood. And so doing things like neighborhood cleanups, mural projects, tree planting, you know, things that can actually go out and start seeing this change that I want to see in my neighborhood is a great way. And, and especially when I was doing engagement with the city of Phoenix and with other folks, like it's interesting who comes to your neighborhood meetings and it's interesting who comes to your events. And these are very different populations. And it's not to say that, you know, it's an either or, but I think it's a both and strategy of like, how do we get outside of what we think of what is a typical, you know, neighborhood organization event and start doing more creative things. And I know there's quite a few of you guys that are already doing a lot of this. Um, and so just kind of, I think that's a big piece of it is just kind of meeting people where they're at, finding out what their interests are and just building relationships because ultimately that's what engagement is about. And that's why people show up. That's why people volunteer. That's why they're willing, you know, um, to do things that they might not want to do. They might not want to pick up their dog poop, but if you have a relationship and you're like, Hey, I saw you left dog poop on my front yard. You know, it's amazing how people react to that and like starting to, you know, solve some of those issues that, you know, online forums can all of a sudden escalate into people essentially yelling at each other. So I think, you know, the in-person, even though we're in COVID is important and thinking about creative ways. I think I answered the question. <laughs> Actually, if I may just chime, chime in and build, build on that a little bit more too, because I also brought a couple of um, photos. So I'll share my screen while I'm, um, hang on one second. Um, that whole, you know, idea of, um, sorry, I'm clearly not good at multitasking here. Um, <laughs> just give me one sec. All right, both of my screens went. Technology uh, never works when you want it to. I think, okay, it's coming. Hang on one sec, it's coming. I think we got it. Can you see? Yeah. Can you see the full yes. screen slide? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, great. Um, yeah, that whole idea of, you know, 
taking things outside of the meeting room, again, I think super important, like thinking about our work at the Living Streets Alliance, like I shared briefly in the beginning with the Prop 407 projects, these bicycle boulevards or walkability projects. Um, that's the entire focus of these events, right? Having an ice cream social at the park is all about, because when you say, oh, it's an open house for a bicycle boulevard, that really attracts a very self-selected sort of group, right? People with that focus show up at these events versus if it's, a, if it's an outdoor movie and an ice cream social at your neighborhood park, that's fun. It sounds great. I want to go to that. And then while you're there, there's an opportunity to engage, talk to the city folks who are there sharing information. And I think that same strategy applies to neighborhood meetings as well. So I just brought up a few examples, pulled up a few examples. So like upper right corner is, you know, the backyard meetings that I was talking about. Actually, this particular meeting leading up to this, I don't know if Rebecca will remember this meeting because we had this idea in the neighborhood um, you know, that we wanted to connect with Rebecca and one other person who was at the time working at the city involved in the Broadway project. And we had this idea to invite them to the neighborhood and um, share what people value about the neighborhood, what's special, you know, the historic homes and whatnot. So, but instead of inviting them to the usual meeting room, we decided to do a little like tour, home tour. So <laughs> Rebecca and the, the other um, city, of, city of Tucson staff at the time ended up going to different homes, you know, visiting different people. And they, they travel there actually on a pedicab. <laughs> and then at the end of the evening, we ended up at the backyard and, you know, had the potluck. And um, still, I think we, ended up continuing with our agenda, the regular meeting, but it's just like some creative ways of thinking about, okay, well, we can invite these folks and just talk to them, or we can actually um, have them experience sort of like a, a moment of this, you know, what do people like about this neighborhood and actually get to visit them in their own spaces. And then another, um, the photo below that, that you're seeing is a neighbor decided to do this like Sunday morning bagels and you know I'm just gonna buy the paper and come on over and we'll just pull up some chairs and shade canopies just outside right in front of the curb and hang out and you know that's not an agendized neighborhood meeting but when people come together they for sure talk about neighborhood issues right I mean there's just no way people don't so I think again very important just like Lisa mentioned like getting outside of the meeting room doing things creatively differently so the Photo, the set of photos on the left side, the top one, while the bottom two are the this tile making project that a few neighbors led in the neighborhood and it took several years, right? And it seemed like it was like a never ending project, but who cares? People got together every week, they talked, they connected, they built relationships and they made tiles, you know, on the, along the way. And then they ended up getting installed on this bench at this little neighborhood pocket park. And then the upper uh, photo is just showing you know, during the during the sort of uh, opening, the ribbon cutting ceremony, we all got together, and again, there was like food or something to drink, something to share. So people, um, you know, shared their feelings about this project. So, um, and I think there's always an opportunity to connect what you what we learn from people during these informal informal or more creative strategies, because there's always folks in neighborhood associations or, or in neighborhoods who wanna do the more sort of formal work and they can take this information and put it into a whatever it is. Cause I think this question had come up, you know, what, how, how does this translate into, um, you know, doing some work, collaborating with the city on something? Well, there'll be folks who can take this rich feedback that, you know, or yeah, resident feedback that they learn during these events and then turn it into a whatever document it is that they're working on. Like in, in this case, we were, we also started working on a neighborhood preservation zone. But I think a lot of the things we heard from neighbors throughout these uh, different types of events actually is it's just really rich information. Thanks, Evren. And I think that goes back to Liz's point that community engagement doesn't have to happen in a room. And I think you really did a nice job of explaining how, how this kind of feedback can then translate into uh, perhaps a policy process that happens with the city or another level of government that, that it doesn't have to just be a formal meeting in a meeting room, which I think uh, is, is really exciting. Um, 
and and it looks like Rebecca definitely does remember uh, that tour and and it stuck with her. I I Rebecca, how I I bet that you don't often get to uh, get out into a rickshaw and tour a neighborhood, and that might have been a special a special occasion. Very special. And what was great was they had neighbors at different points as narrators. So it wasn't just one or two people. We were meeting neighbors and they were telling us about what made a particular building special or, a, you know, a there was a community garden. And so we met quite a wide variety of people. It was a it was a great experience. I often tell people about it. Oh, that's so exciting to hear how that impacted you as someone who works for the city. Thanks for sharing. Um, Margie asks a question in the chat about who keeps track of neighborhood issues discussed at a casual gathering. And I think this it gets to a really good point about how do you move from the beauty of these informal activities to then working with the city to accomplish something that needs to be done. So. Lisa or, or Everin, I don't know if either of you have any words for advice, but I'll, I'll let you weigh in on that. Let, go for it. Sure. I mean, I think there can be different ways of doing that. You can be really intentional about it, where somebody literally is in charge of documenting, right? And again, I think there are people who enjoy those roles. So it's about through these events, it's it's also an opportunity to find out what people's um, where people's passions are, what what they enjoy doing, what role, or how they would like to show up in this space, and and, and what kind of roles they want to play. Right. So I think you could do it more intentionally. Somebody could document, or uh, I mean, I think sometimes this also happens informally in our neighborhood. Um, you know, because people chat with each other. And then when there's a more formal meeting, things come up, people bring up what they heard from their neighbor. Um, so I guess there's different ways to go about it. Thanks, Severin. Lisa, did you have anything to add? I think, you know, some of the informal projects too will come out of an issue that a neighborhood had. So say there's, you know, a problem vacant lot that's in your neighborhood, you know, and you really want it cleaned up, you know, and it's just this continuous kind of conversation about it or a wall that keeps getting graffitied, you know, you can start to identify, okay, here's a challenge or, you know, an issue that we're having in the neighborhood. Here's an opportunity for us to come together as a neighborhood and figure out a solution for that, be it temporary or be it long-term. So I think, you know, there's kind of the two pieces to it. So there's a way to kind of elicit more people to participate. And then there's another way of actually using it as an opportunity to start to address and kind of actually get at some of those issues and get people involved both like, you know, mentally as well as physically making those changes in their neighborhood. And um, I think, you know, and I, you know, with some of the stuff, I think, you know, if it is a little too, you know, you try to make it a little too formal. And I've had this challenge as like a city um, staffer or as a consultant, you know, if you try to have something that's really informal and more of a gathering, and then you try to make it more of like very, you know, get elicit more feedback, um, you just have to be careful with that. There's a definitely a fine line. And sometimes you don't, you don't want people to kind of feel like, oh, well, you said it's this one thing and then it turned into this other thing. So those are just some of those kind of pieces. But I think having someone there, you know, um, with a sign up, you know, um, having someone that has something about like a question of like, what do I love about, you know, what do you love about the neighborhood are great ways to just kind of get feedback, um, but still kind of keep the vibe of it being more informal. So I think, you know, those are kind of those pieces that we don't think about as like, you know, as everyone said, you know, how's the space set up? What is the feeling of the space? You know, is it anxious? Is it, you know, are people nervous? Are they shy? You know, and just kind of being aware of that as you have these meetings as well. So. Thanks, Lissa. I, I know we've talked a couple of times about uh, COVID because it's kind of inevitable that uh, we would talk about it. And I do think that COVID has really changed the reality of how we can meet and gather as neighborhood associations. 
So I, I'd be interested in what either of you have to say for recommendations about how to, how to safely gather or any sort of considerations that you might have for community engagement during COVID and, and what you've seen be successful so far. Lisa, I'll have you start this time. Okay, yeah. Um, so I also, like I said, I, I do consulting um, with uh, private developers and so, um, and other clients. And so we've started doing some meetings, you know, I always have to acknowledge Phoenix is very different from Tucson, um, but we had a neighborhood that we're doing a project in. Um, there was a big gap in internet access um, as well as being an older population. And so we made the determination based on feedback from the community leadership that it was best to do an in-person meeting. Um, and so granted, this was a formal, you know, um, getting feedback on specific design elements that we'd be doing on this project. Um, we held it in a, in a large church. Um, we kept the, the minimal amount of people in it and we just kind of allowed people to kind of like cycle through it um, one at a time. And so it really was given folks gave, I thought it was an amazing opportunity from the perspective of like, you really got the full intention of the design team. You really got to dive into conversations. Um, and everybody wore masks and kept so, you know, distance and putting things on the floor. So that's, you know, one option. Um, but I do think this whole piece of how do we figure out how do we start meeting again? I think there is something to say about being outdoors and just kind of getting outside of the typical way that we meet. Um, Zoom has been great, but I know like for my husband, he's always willing to go to like our HOA meeting um, in person, but then once it turned to Zoom, he just, he's like, nope, I'm in Zoom all day. I am not interested in being in another Zoom meeting. Um, so you might be running into that, somewhat of that yourself. And so thinking about like, how do you start to transition outdoors and how do you, you know, do small things and so, I know um, I'm working with the Menlo Park and they've been talking about, you know, there's an outdoor courtyard space. They can meet, you know, a smaller group, just their board members be able to meet, you know, six feet apart, having people wear masks um, and being outside. And I think a big part of that is just thinking about how do you, you know, keep the event small? How do you put the rules out there first so that people feel comfortable, um, you know, what is the expectation regarding masks? What are the expectations? Um, you know, for social distance and those types of things. I mean, it does, I think the challenge with COVID is it adds like awkwardness times 10 to any interaction. And then, you know, a neighborhood engagement can already be kind of awkward. And so, you know, I think the more that you can be explicit about what the expectations are and what the experience is gonna be like, and just trying to figure out like, how do you, how do you just essentially shrink down everything and have multiple, you know, conversations happening at once. And I don't think we figured out the answer for that, but I think it's an important part of how do we start to re-engage with our neighborhoods and build people's comfort to coming back into the more typical, you know, indoor meeting. So. Thanks, Liz. There's some great ideas there. And as a follow-up, everyone, I'll have you add anything that you want to add there, but I also would be interested in hearing how you might recommend that we re-engage community members as we start to emerge from the pandemic, hopefully. Sure. Yeah, I mean, similar things, right, as Lisa mentioned, and I think um, it's definitely a challenging time, and our lives are now revolving in these zoom boxes and it's taxing people are tired and we've been hearing that so it's i think it's probably a good place to start is to acknowledge that and you know like in our neighborhood for example we've certainly had numbers um dwindling over the past year and one thing that I found helpful recently was we decided we're going to reach out to folks and just check in and you know, is it just a simple, maybe it's just a, maybe they want to participate, but there's techno technology challenges that can be solved. So we wanted to touch base and see if there's any way we can, you know, help them get online if that's what they want to do. And during that, there's, we've also found out some things like I, one neighbor, exactly same thing as Lisa shared, you know, said like, well, you know what, I'm just not, 
I've been following things on the listserv. I support this initiative. I've been following this. I've been following that, but I just cannot participate. I just can't do another Zoom meeting. And that's, I, I think it's helpful to know where people are. And at least um, if it's if it's a simple thing that can be resolved, reaching out. Cause I mean, we may be, we may be in the state for a bit longer, obviously. And coming out of it, I think, um, yeah, it'll be important to, I think that, like this is an opportune time actually coming out of it to try to um, expand into this like non-meeting room meeting format because I think comfort levels are gonna be really variable as we come out of this. Some folks may be more comfortable being indoors and having meetings and others won't. And so it's actually a good time to try out these different ideas. Like let's meet outside, let's do an event, let's do something. And speaking of events, I just, um, let me share again, cause I brought, this is something that Feldman's neighborhood folks did early on in the pandemic. And maybe there's someone here from um, Feldman's. So hang on, let me first put my, <laughs> sorry. If I don't do the order right, I think it gets messed up later, so. Let's first put this in a format that I can slide format. There we go. Um, sorry, the dual screen thing is not working really well for me today. So let's do this. Okay. I think you are now seeing the whole sorter, but so this is just a set of Oops, all right, sorry, here we go. That's what I'm trying to show. This is, um, um, the Feldman's Neighborhood did a porch fest early on in the pandemic and it was very low key. I wasn't personally there, but I got to chat with them later on and received some photos. These are taken by a resident there, Ted Bell. And, you know, they had these signs up, like practice social distancing, masks are required. And they had some musicians in the neighborhood who played, at, they, live, they live in the neighborhood and they played at, a, at somebody's porch. And so there was music, they had some free exchange of things, you know, like a little, I think, table where people um, could bring things and pick things up. And, and this was all facilitated by actually closing the street with those neon green cones that you see in the photo. And this is actually, let's, let's talk about this a little bit more because this, this is a question we got, we received before this, this um, meeting. Um, someone was about asking about how to close down the street. So this is being facilitated through a special events permit. And after I'm done, I'll just put the link in the chat box for that in case anyone's interested. And the different ward offices actually have these cones right now. So getting the permit, placing the cones, um, and I, I'll be honest, I don't know what the policy is right now with COVID because, you know, we had a cap on events and I don't know how they're processing this currently. And I was also told that different ward offices may have some different um, processes for this, but it might be a good place to start calling the ward office and then getting the special event permit submitted. If, if anyone wants to sort of experiment with an idea like this, it can be really simple, right? I mean, it can be a more, uh, um, I guess, involved block party with you know more activities, more food and whatnot. But I think the idea here was that also this is beginning of the pandemic. The whole idea was to like keep people distance. Not really. It's not about gathering in close proximity and doing things together necessarily, but it's sharing the space, sharing a public neighborhood space together while staying physically distant. So, just some food for thought. Great ideas. Thanks, Evren. I, I know that we've been encouraging folks to drop their questions into the chat or to let us know if they have a question. So of course, we want to make sure that we're getting to everyone's questions and addressing them. And I'm trying my best to keep up with the chat. So if, if I happen to have missed your question at some point, uh, don't feel bad about asking it again. We're trying to make sure that we get to everything. But I, I love the good conversation that's been happening. So it is entirely possible that I might have missed a thing, a question or two here or there. So I know that Tom wanted to, Tom Collier wanted to ask a question. Uh, and so Tom, if you wanted to unmute yourself, I, I 
can happily have Alyssa and Everin share their insight. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm with the old Fort Lowell Neighborhood Association. And just to address the COVID issue, we normally in the first, the second Saturday in February have six to 8,000 people visit our neighborhood for old Fort Lowell Day. Uh, we're centered on the Fort Lowell Park area where the military uh, cavalry fort used to be in the 1870s through 1890s to protect uh, Tucson against, uh, you know, depredations. Uh, so one of the things we did was create uh, a series of videos that tried to recapitulate what people uh, uh, would uh, experience if they actually visited Fort Lowell uh, during uh, Fort Lowell days. It's actually two celebrations. There's Fort Lowell Day, which is based on the military and the fort, and we have the cavalry uh, come up from Fort Huachuca, uh, the, the Memorial Cavalry Troop, and they actually have horse drills and horse soldier drills in the uh, Fort Lowell Park, which used to be the parade ground for the fort. And the second component of that is La Reunión de El Fuerte. After the fort was decommissioned, uh, a little Mexican-American farming community grew up here, and they raised vegetables in truck gardens and sold them to Tucson, which was seven miles away. So, and we're also a neighborhood which has, we've got, oh gosh, three or four national uh, places uh, that are on the National Register of Historic Places. We've got a little chapel that received a papal blessing in 2015 on the 100th anniversary of its existence. But we also are, are have uh, a the old San Pedro Chapel, which we bought uh, with a grant and then rehabilitated. And now it's the Neighborhood Community Center. To my question, uh, my question is actually, what experience have you had with membership-based communities? Because one of the ways that we structure it is, uh, well, COVID also has sort of put the kibosh on our being able to rent out the chapel, which is used for weddings and quinceañeras and memorial groups and art shows and things like that. So we're taking a major financial hit this year. We don't get any city grants or anything like that. It's all funded, but we do have a membership component to our association. What is your experience with that? Good, bad, indifferent, what? Thank so, you, that's my question. So this is Lisa. So um, a lot of the business associations that I've worked with, they have more membership-based uh, organizations. Um, a lot of that's based on, you know, businesses need you know, for it to be a valuable experience for them, sometimes they need services, they need, you know, like a shared website sometimes, um, sometimes some marketing efforts, um, sometimes shared security. And so they'll all uh oh, I think we have yeah, Lisa frozen there. Up, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, she sure did. Oh. <laughs> Am I back? Uh -oh. You are back. You froze for a moment there. Okay. Did you hear me about the business I, association? I did, but our association doesn't have hard, has hardly any businesses in our district. I mean, it's mostly residential area. Well, so the way that they structured it essentially is they still had open meetings that everybody could participate in if you were a member or if you weren't a member. Um, but they did ask those businesses to, you know, that were participating and wanted to get some of the value out of it to pay, you know, the membership fees. So I think, you know, it, it's kind of a balance, right? Like I understand that you have, you know, you're kind of in a unique situation where you have, um, you have property now and you have actually expenses. Um, and so it's a little bit different. And so, you know, thinking about, you know, as a member, you know, so it's kind of, I think it's kind of almost like thinking about it as a little bit of a nonprofit is kind of how I'm thinking about it. What do you, I'm kind of looking at Serena right now and, and thinking yeah, about We're organized that. as a 501c3. Okay, so you already have the nonprofit piece to it. So, and the membership, just to kind of understand where you're going with it. So the membership oh, well, is to help pay for some of these expenses that you have, correct? Actually, no, membership is just to have a buy-in. Membership is cheap, it's $25. That's all it is for, for all the whole membership year. We, uh, the, the rentals of the chapel, which of course have gone away, and a couple of uh, 
sales of what they call the antiques and collectible sales and then the the flea market which is essentially people in the neighborhood selling each other stuff you know it's like the mm -hmm. irish taking in each other's laundry to make a living i mean seriously a couple of years ago we had somebody in our house they said oh i put that in the sale four years ago and you bought it so but but those are the things that we've done in the neighborhood to to provide the revenue stream that we need to help keep the chapel maintained and uh, do that that kind of stuff but of course that's all gone away and uh, we're hoping that it will that it will start up again once COVID has gone away too but i just was interested in the membership component is it an encouraging thing is it a discouraging thing um what's been has anybody had any experience with it yeah the only experience like i said was with businesses and i think the only challenge with it is it could be a barrier to entry right and so you know do you have to be a member to participate in these things? Would you have to be a member to be able to do the, you know, the uh, the market, you know, your essentially your neighborhood yard sale and those types of things. So those are the things that I would be, you know, con considering and very careful of, of if it starts to become a barrier for people to entry. Um, but if it's not, and it's just a way to kind of support some of the work that you're doing and get more buy-in, you know, I think it's okay as long as you just make it really explicit that, you know, it's not required, that you're still welcome, that you, you know, it's almost like you don't really get any special perks about it, but it is a way to help support the larger neighborhood and some of the work that you're doing. And I know um, a lot of the historic neighborhoods in Phoenix, they do, they do a lot of the same thing like home tours and a lot of those things to provide revenue to help with doing improvements in their neighborhood. So it's, it's very natural, but a lot of them don't have the, I've never heard of a, a neighborhood organization with membership though. So. I would maybe just real quickly add to that, you know, this is from my neighborhood association perspective, I guess. We do have membership, but it's also very, it's a very small amount. It's $10 for the year. And that's, that gives people, uh, you know, voting privileges for neighborhood issues. But I think for any neighborhood considering uh, membership fees, I would just, uh, encouraged to look at it again, like Lisa said, you know, is, is this creating a barrier to certain people? So if it's going to be a larger amount, especially maybe creating a sliding scale fee structure, just to make sure that it's equitable and people can pay what they can. Um, and for those who can pay more, that's great. But for yeah. people who can't, then there's, you know, different options. So I would just, I would just add that maybe as a, as a strategy. Right now, the membership fee just buys you the ability to participate in the governance of the organization and oh by the way you get in early for the uh for image sales <laughs> thank you very much i appreciate your input thanks tom I'll, for asking oh. i'll mute now thanks for a great question uh and i we know that we i i just saw a question in the chat from margie about suggestions for fundraising especially if a neighborhood association is not a 501c3 and I, I think this is a great question. We've talked about some some things like block parties or murals um, or ice cream socials tonight. So, are there there are things that you've seen be successful uh, for uh, raising funds for neighborhood supplies? And, and Everin, I'll have you started off. And, and before you answer, I'll, I'll just say to Alice, I saw your raised hand, and I will get to you next. Um. Yeah, this is a good question. <laughs> and I think, yes, you know, funds have dwindled, I guess it's fair to say that over the years, there used to be more funding available for neighbors to tap into and city folks can correct me if I'm wrong, but even like for projects like building sidewalks and things like that in the neighborhood, there used to be more flexible pots of money available, which I hope someday that's our, I think, also collective um, decision making power as as you know voters in this city if we are um so that's a side note i think i would love to see more funding being created for neighborhoods to tap into so it's not just like oh it's for this project or that project but it's a flexible pot of funding that neighbor neighborhoods can tap into for whatever their unique needs are in 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 their um in their communities um i mean that aside the current landscape i think you're right it's tricky so for Things like, you know, smaller things, it's always, I think, worth asking if there are businesses located near or in the neighborhood. Um, we've personally had luck with, you know, donations like ice cream or pizza or things like that. So 
I think it's, uh, I, I know this is not going to maybe go very far, but if you're looking at, you know, creating a, a gathering and, and having something to offer to people who show up, it could be as simple as, yeah, okay, well, we're going to have pizza or we're going to have ice cream or something. So that's always worth trying, I think, and we've had good luck with it. And um, for the projects, you know, the, the larger scale, so like the murals and whatnot that Serena mentioned, I will share my screen again because I think it's helpful for um, people to look at it as I'm describing what I'm talking about. So <laughs> bear with me one second, sorry. The sharing is not hard. It's just the slides don't seem to go where I would like them to go once I share, but let's see. Uh, you can see that now, right? Uh, yes, we sure can. Okay, so, but I think I'm just gonna go to, okay, is it gonna, yes, sorry. Okay, let's do this, here we go. Um, so yeah, as Living Streets Alliance, we've partnered with um, a few neighborhoods now to do these types of um, what's called quick build street transformation. So it's, you know, I mean, and again, these things haven't happened overnight. It's long relationships and work that has happened with these neighborhoods um, or school communities before these projects were put into place but it's coming from a place of you know um, neighbors and school communities and families wanting to see traffic calming improvements in their neighborhoods so um as that as, as those um experiences were shared with us and people started you know expressing what they want to see on their neighborhood streets we ended up um, doing a few of these types of projects around town where there was a block party so food and fun activities and it's like an all you know all ages inclusive kind of an event where the neighbors get to transform an intersection in their neighborhood so in this case it's a traffic circle and a mural that got um you know, created in the middle of the traffic circle and leading up to it, there's a lot of work with the neighborhood, uh, you know, collecting themes and symbolism that's important for folks, neighborhood stories that got reflected in the mural and kids got to participate as well as, you know, grown ups. Um, so this is kind of like the um, end product of that, you know, it's a traffic circle, but it's not the traditional traffic circle that you see around town. It's more, uh, I guess, artistic and um expressive of the of sort of like the neighborhood identity and culture um and for these types of things there are you know grants available these types of projects are actually fundable and um i'd be happy to share more resources like right now for example aarp has a grant cycle open till mid-april where these types of projects could be proposed and um, and I know like grant writing applying for these things again it takes time and resources I totally fully acknowledge that and um, it it does take uh, you know human resources <laughs> obviously um, but yeah I mean if anyone anybody's interested in exploring such ideas please reach out to me I'll you know we'll share our contact information maybe in the chat and um, we, I'd be happy to chat but then also the city you know the on the city side the application for these types of projects there's currently not a special application process but i believe i the the folks at the transportation department and other departments are interested in creating something like that and again this is similar to the flexible pots of money you know through maybe a bond measure or something like that this is also one of my ultimate sort of visions is that there would be pots of money available for like in the form of mini grants to neighborhoods so neighborhoods can like come up with these types of ideas and the city would provide assistance and how to make it happen and we can certainly play a role um but um we're not there yet but i'm just putting it out there that i think that's where i would like to see us going and maybe someday we will but in the interim um there are um grant opportunities do pop up from time to time for projects of this nature but for smaller scale like i said block parties and whatnot i think it's a bit easier like i put the special event application in the chat um those cones are available um at the ward offices and that's a bit of a maybe a first step um <laughs> and then and then something like this we could, I, I i'd be happy to explore with anyone who's interested i'll just put it that way <laughs>
Thanks so much, Evren. I, I know Alice has patiently uh, had her hand raised. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, thanks for your patience. Well, I was gonna also uh, show you what I actually look like, but whatever. Um, no, I had some comments and that is particularly about membership. And we've always had uh, a membership, which has tried to be $10 a year per household to be nominal so that somebody could participate. And what we found is that we were we would send out a, uh, a newsletter to those folks first class, because we have found that our city, our city lists don't get everybody. We have people with PO boxes that really want them in a PO box. So this is how we have tried to do that. I've also got on our list, people who've paid money who don't actually live in the neighborhood but they own property in the neighborhood. They want to be able to get the newsletter. So that's one of those kinds of things that I think is really interesting that membership can do. That uh, if you, and you know, collecting $10 is not a big deal, so long as you've got a treasurer who's willing to uh, take care of this for you. So that was just my comment back to Fort Lowell and their membership problems. So I just think, I think it is worthwhile because you want people to, to feel like they're participating. And that's, that's one of the things that I think is really important is to have kind of jobs for people to be able to do. Now we have, we used to hand deliver newsletters and I had, you know, 20 people who would fan out over three quarters of a square mile here and, and hand out newsletters. Since COVID, we haven't done that. But those po folks felt very empowered and they felt very, uh, they had a lot of ownership of their roots. So that's another way of engagement in a way. So anyway, I'll shut up and let you all do the better talking because that you've got much more to say than I do. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Alice. I also wanted to make sure that I highlighted one of the comments in the chat that Amanda shared that Armory Park has been discussing offering a volunteer alternative to their news or to their dues, excuse me, and out of concerns for equity and increasing access, which I think is a really cool idea just to make sure that everyone can be included in membership. And Lisa, I saw that you unmuted. So if you have things, comments to add, please hop in. Yeah, I thought Alice made a good point about, you know, ownership and like getting involved and just delivering newsletters, how powerful that is for folks. And I think you know, that's another reason why it's so important, you know, membership's one thing and there are, you know, I'm kind of torn about it when I put on my equity lens with it, you know, is it can, you know, as uh, Margie kind of pointed out, $10 in a uh, is a lot in a low income neighborhood. So there are some challenges with it, but I think there are some great ways to just build that ownership and getting people involved and allowing them to contribute. Um, you know, that was one of the big lessons I learned, you know, with working with the city is so often we would at, went out and just inform folks, you know, and I think sometimes as neighborhood associations, you kind of reflect, you know, I've seen that they can reflect that same structure of, okay, we're going to inform you about what we're doing, but instead thinking about, well, how do we engage you? How do we, you know, to Evan's point, how do we find out about your passions and how do we give you a job within the neighborhood? And, you know, that comes with some challenges. They're not, you know, not everybody has the bandwidth to do it. I have two small children. So, you know, I make it through a day and get a couple things off my to-do list, I win. Um, but, you know, if you threw a, you know, a kid-friendly party, you know, I'd probably be there and I'd probably be happy to bring my toys and to contribute in some way. So I think it's just kind of connecting with folks and figuring out what their needs are and, and the ways that they contribute and being open to that conversation and allowing them. And I think when you do that, it's amazing what starts to come out and the way in which you just start to find resources. Did I just freeze? <laughs> oh, I no, just appeared off the screen for a second. Okay. So I think that's an important piece of just, you know, how do you contribute? How do you let people, you know, participate? And, um, and, and in that you'll find an abundance of resources is what I found. And it's out of those relationships, you know, with nonprofits, with city folks, with different folks that, you know, stuff happens that you never thought was possible. A labor union will all of a sudden, you know, the painters union will all of a sudden donate like a ton of paint to you, you know, and you can have your mural project. It was just a matter of asking and going down the street to that, you know, that labor union hall that was there. So, you know, get out, get out in your neighborhood. <laughs> 
Thanks, Lisa. Evren, I saw you unmute as well, so I don't know if you had something to add. Well, yeah, I just, you know, similar thoughts. I think uh, shifting a little bit from the funding piece, but going back to something Lisa shared. Yeah, we were talking about, you know, okay, how can we create different types of events just so it's more inclusive, more people feel like, I mean, Lisa shared a very personal experience, right? If it's kid friendly, I might just go because, you know, that's all I can do at the end of the day. But then I think also creating those different avenues is a way to invite people's like passions and talents in the neighborhood too. So with the tile project example I shared, right? That's, there's neighborhood talent. I mean, in, your, in all of our neighborhoods, there are people who, you know, are, <laughs> are very multifaceted. They're talented, they're, they're passionate about things they'd like to share. And I think creating these different, different ways of um, engaging or different types of events is really a way to bring it out too and making it more age inclusive as well. So I'll share one more real quick. Um, because like, for example, one thing we did was um, when Ciclovia, so Ciclovia, like I shared as an LSA event, but it was also, um, it happened to come through our neighborhood. And when it came through our neighborhood, we um, decided to organize a neighborhood hub. Um, and when we decided to organize the neighborhood hub, we invited neighbors, you know, we just kind of put a call out there. Okay, this is sort of like the general, idea and how do you do you want to participate so how do you want to do that and so the photos you see here is this young person in the neighborhood right she's um she was i think maybe a high school student at the time and certainly had never attended a neighborhood meeting but she came out and she created this amazing chalk art station that morning and created this like butterfly photo booth and people came and took photos there day, all day long, person after person. And then one other neighbor for another Ciclovia created that signage that you see, it's like a wayfinding sign that points people to different neighbor destinations. And he had just like, he had some scrap wood lying around. So I think just um, tapping into people's talents in addition to tapping into people's wisdom, because people have a lot of wisdom about the places that they live and different ways, different, different avenues to bring all that out is, is super important. Thank you, and, and what a neat way to get to see all of your neighbors' gifts and talents when they contribute to a neighborhood event like that. And Amanda, I see your hand has been raised and you've also waited patiently, so I please go ahead and unmute and ask or share whatever it is that you would like. I guess it's kind of a, a half-formed thought question, and I, I think maybe everyone can speak to this a little bit because of some of the activity that's going on in Rincon Heights like uh, with the, the student housing project and stuff. And uh, I think there's a bit, I get, I'm new to the association in Army Park, but I, I there's a lot of cynicism about what the association can do and a feel of loss of power and consultation from the city and how the association is brought into decisions that affect the neighborhood and it, it feels often very reactive and um there's also a lot of well you know don't don't send a letter to you know the council members about reed park because we want to save our political graces for when you know we have to have this conversation about g plex right you know and 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 i guess what i'm just like looking for is like how do we build back power for our neighborhood associations because we see how much uh how valuable they are for connecting people to what is going on and connecting to each other and creating a thriving city which is all part of our goals um but then at the same time like if you don't deliver on the other side and it kind of makes these people feeling powerless i think that's another part of why people don't always participate um so I, it's not i, I so, so apologize for the awkward question kind of but yeah i don't know just that's the topic that's kind of on my mind lately well i know oh i'll let everyone jump in but um it is definitely you know at least my experience with working with neighborhoods right is like 
you've been in the game a long time, some of those folks, you know, it, it, it's tough. And so some of the work that I've done with some of the neighborhood associations is like, you just kind of got to, you know, I think part of your question is like, um, and I'll let everyone jump in in just a second, but, you know, part of it too is like processing old trauma that occurred in a neighborhood. And sometimes neighborhood associations get kind of stuck on something um, and they can't kind of get past a conversation. And so figuring out ways to kind of let go of some of that past stuff. And I'll share my screen real quick of an example that we did in, um, in the Roosevelt Row neighborhood. Um, and so this was, uh, it's called the Celebration of Life and it's in the Roosevelt Row neighborhood, which was an arts district. Um, and during this, this time, it was going under, undergoing some significant changes. A lot of historic buildings were getting demolished. The arts community was starting to get kind of pushed out of it. Um, and it started becoming really negative. And so one of the things that they did in partnership with ASU and with the business community was put together the celebration of life in a way to kind of process some of that. Um, and essentially it was a memorial for the neighborhood and just kind of going through and seeing the changes and talking about it and having a, um, a band kind of lead the whole procession and kind of treat it like a funeral to a certain extent and acknowledging some of the changes that are coming. You know, I think that's some of the biggest challenges of working with neighborhoods is we want to take them back to a time and not recognize, okay, the city is changing around it. There's a light rail street or, the, you know, there's a streetcar station now next to my single family neighborhood. What does that mean? And what changes are coming with that investment of that infrastructure? Um, and the changing of zoning and some of those, you know, um, benefits that the city gives to get development. Um, and so giving people ways to process that and to connect as a neighborhood and kind of understand what that means and acknowledge the reality of what's coming and figure out solutions to move forward with it. Um, I think that's a really important thing that sometimes we don't think about is there is this, this trauma that can exist in neighborhoods and you have to kind of work through it in order to kind of move on to the other side. And especially as a new person coming in, seeing that, you know, and figuring out those ways. And then I'll pass it over to Evren because I'm sure she has some good insight. Um, Amanda, I think those questions are like, I think it's you're getting some, these are like core questions about community engagement and the need for shifting the paradigm, I think around community engagement. And so, yeah, like Lisa said, I think trauma is a big piece and there's like so many reasons for that. There is, I mean, I think we can't deny here, <laughs> sitting here talking about this issue that there is, you know, mistrust or distrust that exists between the city and the communities. And this is not just a city of Tucson issue. This is something that is happening across the United States in many different communities. And um, some of it has to do with yeah, neighborhoods not being listened to, or not just neighborhoods, let me just say people, because I just want to also like even take it outside of neighborhoods, because we can just start peeling this, like the layers of this onion. And there's also, I think, problematic relationships between, not just relationships, but like, let's just say dynamics between a neighborhood association and the people who live in a neighborhood at large. So I can get to that in a second if there's more time, but I'm also watching our time here. But going back to that, yeah, there's, I think, you know, historic disinvestment. There is actually historic intentional harm in some communities. You know, typically black, brown communities, communities of color have experienced things like freeways dividing through their communities. And so there are very legitimate reasons, I think, for the trust to be an issue. And so how do we repair that? I think repairing that has a lot to do with a paradigm shift at the city level too. And again, I'm not just talking about the city of Tucson, but here we are in the city of Tucson. So I guess we can talk about the city of Tucson, but how can we move from seeing people, people who live in the neighborhoods and the communities as implementing from just like, you know, check the box community engagement to actual implementation partners? How can we become thought for partners? How can we create collaborative processes, whether that's the budget process or 
how does the project scope get defined? You know, can we move from like, okay, here's 50 projects that we're gonna implement over the next 50 years, whatever, I'm just making up five years, let's say. And we're just gonna now go to the communities and say, okay, what do you like? What do you dislike? Here's the three options. How can we move from that model to a more, okay, let's like, let's go to communities and let's define what people's priorities are and let's figure out ways to match our funding streams to the actual you know, issues people wanna address in their own neighborhood. So this could, I think, be like the topic of a whole nother session that we can spend two, three, four, five hours on. But I think you're spot on. And I think those issues are very real. And, and as an organization, I think when we talk about, oh, you know, we're sort of bringing this additional perspective to the table in doing community engagement, it's really about, um, trying to shift that paradigm. How can we make the community engagement framework itself to be more meaningful, more inclusive and more equitable? And there's a lot of work to be done, I think in that realm. And just that one piece of it. Yeah, I think within the neighborhood associations too, I'm just very cognizant of, you know, there are issues there too. There's like, I, I think just because there's a neighborhood association doesn't mean that that, that formal body actually represents the entire group of people. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that as a starting place. And then also to um, create dynamics that go beyond that. So I'll leave it at that because I see that we have four minutes and maybe we have some other things to address, but super, I think, important core questions. Completely agreed. And yes, we unfortunately do have to wrap up, but I wanted to thank everyone who has asked such great questions. And before everyone clicks leave, I wanted to give both Alyssa and Evren a last minute or two, uh, mostly like a minute to share any final thoughts that you have uh, as we wrap up. And then I will hand it over to Rebecca to end things. So Lisa, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think Everyn's point that she just made is really powerful. You know, places are really complicated. There's a lot of different factors. There's a lot of history there. Um, you start to study redlining, um, how federal government has invested in places. You know, it gets, it gets pretty dark and there's some big challenges there. Um, and so I think just, you know, my best piece of advice and what I tell myself when I always, I go out into community engages, engagement is just be humble be open and understand, you know, there's disconnects, there's challenges, there's drama, there's all of those kind of pieces. But, you know, when we connect and when we become vulnerable and we really try to find ways and solutions, it's incredible what can happen. So, um, you know, just, just stick with it. It's hard work, um, but I'm sure all of you guys are doing amazing things and will continue to. But also at the same time, I challenge you to, you know, look at a different perspective and see things from a different angle and understand that sometimes your solution can actually be a problem from someone else and be willing to have that conversation and build those relationships. So keep up the good work, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And Evren, any final thoughts? Um, sure. Um, I'm just kind of reflecting on this last bit of conversation, especially. And, um, trying to wrap this up in two minutes, but I think one thing that as neighborhood folks, we all can be cognizant of and try to do better is maybe how can we not duplicate the same sort of pattern and the dynamic that we see as problematic? Okay, so like you brought up something, Amanda, okay, well, there's like this mistrust and there's like, you know, between the neighborhoods and the city and maybe things are evolving, you know, but there are reasons for that to be there. And like, how do we, how do we at the micro level ensure that things are different? So one thing that comes to my mind is like one big aspect of community engagement, right? Is to, in, in terms of making it inclusive and equitable and meaningful, meaningful is about opening up to people outside of the, you know, sort of the, let's just say usual people who show up at these meetings because they have the time and the resources to show up at these meetings. And I'm talking about more like right now, public meetings, larger scale. Um, but how can, we, how can we get beyond the usual people who show up at these meetings, right? And like, how can we duplicate that at a neighborhood level? And I think 
that principle of meeting people where they are is key in that regard as well. Because it's just, even if it's just a simple, simple thing in the neighborhood, maybe we're just going to plant trees, right? And I mean, similar things, things like this happened before I've experienced, not necessarily in my neighborhood, but other neighborhoods we work with. And it's like, well, you know, we put it on the list or we put it on the, you know, it's been announced at the neighborhood meeting. And so people should have known about it. Well, it just doesn't work that way. Right. And it's like, and if we have difficulty with this at the larger scale, at the, at the city level, I think we can relate to the fact that this maybe doesn't work at the very micro neighborhood level as well. So knock on people's, let's knock on people's doors, right? Maybe when we knock on somebody's door where we're thinking about doing this tree planting project, we'll find out that, well, that person has a vegetable garden up front, right? And they want the sun. So sunshine, sunlight, they need it. So what if we could plant that tree like three feet away to this way? And like by talking to them, we can, I mean, I'm just sharing a super simplistic example for a reason here, because I think sometimes the issues at the neighborhood level can be simple. Sometimes they're very complicated, but I think starting there and and building off of that principle of, um, you know, how do we make connections? How do we build relationships? And how do we meet people where they are? So we are hearing from more people with more perspectives and bringing more wisdom um, to the table is sort of, I guess, my final thought. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Lissa. And, and thank you, Rebecca and, and City of Tucson Neighborhood Resources. We really appreciate the opportunity to share these thoughts on community engagement. So Rebecca, I don't know if you have any final thoughts, but it's just all I'm you. sure everybody is uh is ready to go to supper or something else for the evening. But these are all, this is a conversation that's very near and dear to my heart. So this has been uh, really, really fun in a strange way <laughs> for, for me. So thank you so much. We are looking at having additional workshops. We're working on them. We will announce it. And thank you everybody. And remember, there are neighborhoods are doing lots of great things and often they don't know what each other are doing. You are resources for each other, please reach out. And if you need uh, help, let me know so that I can guide you to some of the other just super local resources here. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Abrin. Thank you, Serena and Jane. Really, really appreciate this. Night, everybody. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you all. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Rebecca. Have a good night. Okay, Margie. Great <laughs> to see you. Take care. Take care of you.